Um, hello everyone. Uh, today we will discuss the mathematical ethics of clinical trials. Um, this is the podcast of the uh, AI Safety Working Group in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, this topic is very relevant in the current context of COVID, where people are looking for drugs. Uh, but as we will see uh, in our discussion, uh, this is also very relevant when experimenting on humans on a large scale and in the general context of uh, safe decision making. Yeah, this is a pretty uh, relevant for large scale systems, but maybe we can talk first about uh, the clinical trials, which is a big deal, of course, uh, these days with the COVID-19 situation. And uh, what's uh, quite remarkable is that uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has uh, started a, a new uh, clinical trial based on the ideas, on, the, on, on some very mathematical ideas uh, around the prime of exploitation versus exploration. Maybe Louis you can describe this a little bit. Yes, so definitely uh, the, the goal of uh, clinical trials is somehow to, uh, to, to come up with an estimate of how good different uh, clinical interventions can be. And uh, this is uh, typically uh, the part that is called uh, exploration. So exploration consists in testing uh, several uh, methods and exploring to, to, to measure how good these methods are. Uh, on the other hand, and this is something that we also desire a lot, which is exploitation, means that once we have collected information about the different uh, available methods, Exploiting it means that we will uh, use the methods that we know uh, is the best. Uh, it can be uh, case dependent or context dependent, but still, have its uh, exploitation consists in uh, using the information we have collected to be able to, to make good decisions. Uh, overall, uh, both exploitation and exploration are needed. Uh, an, an example to illustrate this for, it could be that you have the choice between two treatments, A or B, and the treatment A, you already have given it to 1,000 people, and somehow you estimated a 50% uh, success rate. Uh, and the treatment B has not been tested a lot, let's say only three cases, and uh, it has been successful for just one case. So you estimated a 33% uh, success rate. Now you have one million uh, one million person uh, to, to treat with either treatment A or B. So a pure exploitation would say, now let's use only the treatment A because uh, the estimation of the success rate is higher than for treatment B. But this can be a mistake because uh, simply because now if I ask you the question, how, how sure are you that treatment B is less efficient at treatment A? The answer is that you should not be totally sure of it. Uh, treatment B has been only tested with uh, three cases, and it's possible that it has a 70% success rate, and that these three cases were simply a uh, little unlucky, and that's why you estimated only 30% success rate on these three cases. So actually, if you want to implement a strategy that will uh, save more lives out of these uh, 1 million people that you want to treat with uh, treatment A or treatment B, it's, uh, it's, it's necessary that you uh, do some exploration using treatment B uh, just so that you have a better estimate of the, of the chances of success of uh, treatment B. Uh, maybe you will estimate that it's less than 50%. In that case, uh, treatment A would be the option that you want to use most on these uh, 1 million uh, uh, patients. But uh, there is a small chance that treatment B is better and, uh, and not finding this chance actually uh, concerns the life of uh, more than 1,000 of people. So yeah, that's why uh, there, there is a need for exploration and exploitation. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to try to generalize right away to this point to this, because it's extremely general. And the reason why it's extremely general is that you can just replace uh, treatment A and treatment B by action A and action B oh, I and, and anything. And uh, usually when we think of ethics, ethics is a lot about decision making. And when we think about ethics, I think intuitively we have the sense that there's the right thing and the wrong thing to do. And that it's a matter of doing the right thing. But prior to this, there's actually a very important phase, which is understanding what is good and what is bad. Um, 
when in the case, for instance, of the COVID situation, it turns out it should be very, very, very difficult because there are different treatments. Uh, like right now, WHO is uh, testing uh, four different treatments uh, in addition to the standard uh, treatment. And the differences between the treatment may be very small. But, and you may say, well, it, maybe it's not that big deal if we don't, uh, we're not successful at making the difference between the, the effectiveness of two different treatments. But if there's only one person difference between two treatments, uh, then we suppose that one treatment saves one more life every 100 patients than the other treatment. Treatment A is slightly better than treatment B. You would say, yeah, of course we should do treatment A. But the problem is, how can you make sure that you, you, you detect this small deviation? And this turns out to be very, very difficult. In fact, uh, if you do rough calculations, uh, you can see that uh, essentially the number of experiments that we that you will have to be doing is one over one divided by this difference, so squared. So the difference is uh, one patient every one uh, one uh, one life every one hundred patient. That's a one percent difference. This means that the order uh, the, of magnitude of the number of tests you should be doing is uh, one divided one percent squared. It would be ten thousand. And that's 10,000, that's already huge. That's more than what we usually do for our clinical trials. Uh, so that's really, really, really big. And uh, potentially you you may need to find even like better differences. Maybe the differences are going to be smaller. And it is a big deal because if you can save 1% more lives out of the, the patients that are in, say in critical condition of the COVID-19, uh, depending on, on sources, uh, the number of, of total cases in the world can be sometimes estimated at hundreds of millions, uh, if not more. Uh, and let's say that there's 10% of critical cases out of them. Then if you can save 1% of these 10% of 100 million cases, uh, this turns out to be 100,000 lives. So making sure you're doing the, the exploration right is a matter of saving a hundred thousand lives, uh, and thus it, it is a, a huge, huge deal. Just to uh, explain, maybe where we are coming, uh, where this is so uh, coming from the the, the exploration exploitation dilemma, uh, which is, as you said, a very general dilemma that you can face whenever you're doing decision making, and you have to choose between decision A or decision B. Uh, public policy A, public policy B, uh, health decision A and B, or um, social welfare choice A and B, etc. Uh, the thing is that uh, in the second half of the 20th century, there was a field who had to study this with large numbers uh, and on tight deadlines, and this field turns out to be computer science. So in, in computer science, uh, we had to scale to, to make these decisions on, on, on large numbers and, and, and fast. And um, so this, this will sound uh, weird to people coming from outside computer science, but uh, for example, where this has found a lot of applications is in advertisements. Uh, online, in online, when, whenever you are on a social network, uh, there is an optimization of which ad you are seeing that is the result of an exploration exploitation experiment where we test a, an advertising policy on you, and then another advertising policy on another group, and then we online, like on the way, we are optimizing and selecting and transiting from A to B. And in, in, in clinical trials, we, we talk in terms of uh, clinical arm or, or, or trial arm. Like, uh, like imagine you have many arms, and uh, and. and uh, <clears throat> The mathematics of, of this kind of decision making, of this kind of optimization, turns out to be very, very relevant in, in, in building the adaptative uh, clinical trials that Leo was, was, was trying to, to explain. So though the maths has developed in computer science, we believe um, it is very urgent that it gets um, uh, known a bit more from uh, other fields. And, uh, and, and it is urgent, we are now in an urgent situation where where people from outside uh, fields of online advertising or, or machine learning know about um, what we call, for instance, here, multi and uh, bandits and, 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 and all the developments that have been made in exploration exploitation dilemma. 
so that we don't we don't jeopardize a hundred thousand lives. Yeah, as you, as you also say. Yeah, uh, and uh, so for the multi-armed bandit, which is this uh, framework to uh, nice framework to think about this, which you've just presented, uh, we can actually ask we go see the question: uh, When is it that we should stop exploration or carry on exploration? Uh, before moving to the exploitation phase. Mm. So typically for clinical trials, the, the question would be, what is the sample size of the of the set of patients who are going to do the test on? Um, and uh, the mathematics of uh, multi-armed bandit has given us uh, the answers to these questions, at least in some in some model. Mm. And the answer, if you do, do yeah, optimize the, this this sample size. Uh, turns out to be 120,000 people if you assume that there are going to be uh, 10 million critical cases. 120,000 people is huge, is a lot more than, uh, like maybe it's 100 times more than what we usually do. So that's very important not to neglect the mathematics. Hmm. Because again, like the, this is hundreds of thousands of lives that are at, at, at stakes. Um, but uh, maybe you can do better than this because here we, I'm just talking about uh, an experiment where you, uh, a case where you only do first pure exploration, you, you test all of your things, all, your, all of your treatments, and then pure exploitation, you only uh, uh, administer the, the best uh, treatment right. out of the, 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 the ones you, you've tested. Uh, and it turns out that uh, mathematicians uh, have found a way to optimize even this, instead of having a, a sharp distinction between exploration and exploitation, you can have a smooth transition between exploitation, exploration and exploitation. Essentially, as you go, you, you use the data that you've learned to not cause harm to the patients you're doing the test on, uh, but you're still exploring so that future patients can, be, uh, can, can receive the best possible treatment. Um, and there's again a very nice framework to do this, multiple algorithms to do this. One, one of the one of the algorithms, uh, most successful algorithms, is called uh, UCB for upper confidence bound. Uh, and uh, essentially, what upper confidence bound is going to do is uh, it's going to ha have uncertainty. It's going to use its measure of the uncertainty of the effectiveness of different treatments. So you can imagine that a treatment that uh, seems bad, but on which there has not been a lot of tests so far. It's uh, some, something that probably is, is worse than the best treatments, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. And maybe actually it's better and you just haven't uh, gathered enough data to know it yet. So whenever this is the case, every now and then you're going to try a little bit, but very rarely, not, not too frequently, but every now and then you're going to try a little bit this to reduce this uncertainty. Just, just uh, one small comment. Uh, for, for, like some people might be scared hearing that we need a hundred thousand people, we need a hundred twenty thousand people in experiments. Um, actually, the mathematics that gave us these numbers also uh, give us good news. Uh, so, for example, for instance, if the difference between treatment A and B is significant, so if in the first trials you see that there is a, uh, I don't remember, Lay made the exact computation, fifteen percent more. Uh, success rate. Uh, so, if the success rate of A is is fifteen percent larger than the success yeah. rate of B, then you only need what two thousand. Yeah, two thousand patients. Yeah, so, so th those mathematics are not only useful to know that we need a lot uh, of of people on cl in clinical trials when the difference of uh, of success in, in drugs are very slow, are very uh, small. They also tell us that if you have a significant difference, you can stop at at a small number of trials. And then you can stop and give people treatment B and not give them treatment A. Yeah, that's a very important point uh, because right now, uh, most of the clinical trials, you first set a sample size and then you run the experiments over all your sample size, even if along the way you found out that one treatment was uh, definitely better, like, like hugely better than the other, uh, using adaptive clinical trials, which is a, an idea that. Uh, that's been out there for the last uh, maybe 30 years or 40 years. But uh, over the last decade or so, like we really have uh, co compelling mathematics and uh, there's a huge push towards these ideas uh, by uh, a lot of biostatisticians mostly. Um, using this, you can optimize the as you go. 
as you learn more and more data, you can use this data to know when it is that you should stop the experiment and, and, and do the exploitation. And this is, again, a matter of saving lives. Uh, it's not that one of the treatment is going to be bad. Uh, I think that there's this idea that we doing the experiments so all like there's the one good and one bad treatments. But what can happen is that there's one good treatment and one very good treatment. And you want to find this out very quickly early on. Like you want to make the, the difference so that you know that this good treatment, even though it's saving more lives than no treatment at all, you still want to discard it because there's a better one. Uh, so uh, the, the framework of uh, multi-arm uh, bandit and particularly this idea of adaptive clinical trials is, is critical if you want to, to maximize the number of, of lives saved. Yeah, another advantage of uh, this, uh, this adaptive method is that they are very flexible. Uh, for example, in the case when a, a new treatment is added uh, during the course of uh, the experiment, uh, these this solutions to the multi arm bandit problem, they easily adapt to a new treatment. A, a new treatment will simply be one on which we have, uh, from the start, high uncertainty and will be selected in an adaptive manner uh, at first a lot. But if, if, if the first test views with this treatment are negative, then it will be very quickly uh, not selected anymore. And on the other hand, if, the, if it shows performance that is similar to the best treatment or better than the best treatment, then it will be continuously selected more and more. And, uh, on the, but what you described before, the, the way uh, experiments on, uh, on treatment are, are, are run uh, today, is they don't use these uh, multi embedded processes. And, and uh, it's very complicated to make them uh, flexible enough to incorporate a new treatment in the middle of a, an experiment. Yeah, yeah, the, and you can show that you have uh, great uh, gains in terms of expected number of lives saved or effectiveness of the treatments over all uh, its uh, both the, the exploration phase and the exploitation phase. And uh, again, this is ethically, it's it's very, very, very important. Like uh, again, it's a matter of, uh, of a huge number of potential lives or of psycho psychological dramas from all the families and, and so on. So you really want to be uh, identifying rigorously, quickly uh, and effective, efficiently uh, the best possible treatments. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this framework is really posing this question and it's, it's really solving in a sense a, a huge ethical problem that was uh, unsolved uh, thus far. So, which brings us maybe to uh, one aspect of it is that, um, so how, how much un uh, overlooked it is uh, by, by, by researchers. And I will be provocative, including the researchers who work on it. <laughs> so, so, for example, if you look at the statistics and machine learning community, they will often, act, they, they, the, the fact that it was motivated by adaptive trials, etc., cetera, is, is known. But, uh, many people in the in the machine learning researchers community, for, like if you ask them about multi-armed bandits, most often they think of it as a way to optimize ads, for example. Yeah, yeah, because this is what what we hear these days. But the thing is that it is there, it is ready, it is already deployed, and uh, it doesn't need too much change to be, to be used for something else. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, we will we will maybe develop this later uh, in the discussion, but it can be also used for experimenting, like policies on social networks, for decreasing hate speech, all the bad things we don't want to have on on our public discussion. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a reflex. Uh, uh, some too often maybe associated to the scientific method, the idea that you should first set a sample size, and and do the experiment. Uh, and this has been the norm in, in science uh, over the last uh, century, uh, thanks to works by Fisher and, and other statisticians. But uh, arguably, we've we've grown since then. Like mathematics has evolved, and we have better tools mm. to do, do these experiments in a in a more efficient way, in a more rigorous way, but also in a more ethical manner. Uh, so I think it's very important that everyone uh, uh, understands a little bit this idea. There's there's investment in uh, the pedagogy and the explanations of these ideas, uh, mm -hmm. because this is extremely relevant, not for clinical trials for, for sure, but not only. Not for only. Clinical trials. It is for clinical trials. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and uh, maybe you want to to move on to other applications of this framework to to other areas. Uh, so I, I guess one thing we we have in mind is trying to understand what is the impact of uh, of uh, social media algorithms, uh, especially recommender systems on uh, people's uh, behavior in general. Uh, 
this is a, a hugely important. I think we've discussed this a lot on, on this uh, on this podcast, but this is extremely important because uh, there are a huge number of people on these social medias. Uh, just to recall a few numbers, uh, uh, YouTube is uh, used by two billion users uh, worldwide, uh, with an average of uh, half an hour per user. That's one billion hours of watch time on YouTube per day. Most of which is coming from the recommendation system. Yeah. 70, 70 percent of it is coming from the recommender system and not from active search by the user. Yeah. So it's really important to know what is the implication of this. Like, what does it imply in terms of uh, people's uh, willingness to to wash their hands, to keep their social distance these days? Uh, how does it affect what people think about climate change, about uh, uh, different potential risks, about the future pandemics, about the investments in, uh, in education, in, uh, uh, in different fields? I, I think it, it's, it's a big deal. And we don't have a lot of data about this. We are in a situation we, where there's nothing to exploit yet because we don't have the understanding of the impact of these, uh, of these algorithms. At least, arguably, not the sufficient understanding to know what ought to be done. In this context, if you want to do good, uh, you first have to understand that there's a lot of uncertainty, and you should also, like, if you apply the exploration exploitation framework, you should try to do some exploration to better understand what's effective, what what, is, what are the 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 robustly beneficial actions that you should uh, be undertaking, uh, and arguably, you should. Imp apply this uh, this framework of uh, of uh, material and bandit to what algorithms are doing these days, and to use this information to uh, minimize the harm they're doing or maximize uh, 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 the good that they are doing. Mm -hmm. One key example of uh, of this kind of experiment on social network uh, is something we talked about on the podcast already, which is the experiment on uh, emotional contagion on Facebook, mm -hmm. where they, they, they slightly modified the algorithms to, to show more negative uh, messaging on, on Facebook feed or more positive messages on the Facebook feed of, uh, of different users. And they observed a, a statistical, uh, statistically significant difference. Like the, the reaction of, uh, of users were changed by something between uh, one per 1,000 or one percent. So, and this experiment was done on a very large number of users. Uh, what uh, what we recommend here is to use uh, to to do similar experiment but following the multi bandit uh, uh, concepts uh, and the reason for this is that if this this kind of experiment can have uh, very important information and uh, can also have very positive impact but the risk is that they can also have a negative impact uh, showing more negative uh, messages on Facebook to users made them also post less positive messages and, uh, and, uh, and uh, post more negative messages. Uh, it's, clear, it's clear that uh, it, it can be something that we don't desire and it's understandable. Uh, just maybe before you, you move on uh, developing this, uh, so I just want to react on something. Uh, so because Lay said like, um, so these algorithms recommend systems so that you can, you can study them to make them go, do good and not do, get a good, do, do, uh, do bad. Uh, just because I, I see already people probably thinking that then you have to define what is good, what is bad. We're not talking about defining good or bad in an absolute way. You can just pick a subset of very consensual things that society agrees on. For example, we don't, people, we don't want people to commit suicide. But this is something arguably we would all agree on. So you can study algorithms and you can, you can, you can, you can do studies and understand how, how much they could influence, for example, suicide rates. Yeah. And arguably, we would all agree that our common goal is to minimize suicide rate. And, and, and then you can pick up, like, like, grow the list like this on topics where we have social consensus. We're not talking about defining good or defining bad in a mathematical way, because since the, the title of this podcast is Mathematical Ethics. So it's not about defining what good or bad is. It's just it's about like starting from the easy topics on which we have a social consensus. Uh, let's reduce insults, let's reduce hate speech, uh, let's not trigger suicide in teenagers, etc. So, so you can study these algorithms and their effects on these consensual topics. And by studying them, you can, you can make them do, do less harm. 
at least on topics on which you have social consensus. Yeah, and uh, where mutual knowledge is interesting is that uh, while doing this exploration, while doing this experiment, we are affecting the world. Yeah. And, uh, and we want to be affecting the world in the best way possible during the experimentation phase. And uh, that's what uh, Mutual Bandit uh, give us as a solution. It's the solution to, in expectation, uh, have the highest positive impact on, uh, on the world while still doing your exploration and your experiments. Yeah, yeah and, and should we stress that the exploration is needed to do, to do good in the future. Right? It's, uh, it's not uh, exploration for exploration's sake, mm -hmm. which is sometimes criticized, and I think uh, for good reasons to, to some sort of some experiments. But here, like we, we want to do good, and if you want to do good, then you, you need, need to exploration. Oh, yes. Because so basically, account. just like uh, so, just to simplify again for people who are just hearing about these topics for the first time. So exploration is the phase where you want to know about the state of the world. What, what, what works? What does? What does? Well, like what action causes which effects? Yeah. And then exploitation is about taking the action. So to take that action, you need to have done some exploration initially, so that you know that action A would lead to less suicides than action B, and then so you take action A. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's worth uh, stressing this uh, uh, a bit more still, like may maybe there are things we want about the world, we want people to be happy, we want people to be enjoying themselves, having intellectual uh, or, or whatever, being in good health and so on. Uh, so we have some not of these be, goals. Not, not be infected by COVID-19. Yeah, not so being infected. Not we would agree on. <laughs> yeah, there are so many things we agree on and that we think are desirable. The difficulty is that the action we take, like this can be medical treatment, but this can be what is recommended by the YouTube recommender system. These uh, actions that we take, it's not clear what the impacts are going to be on all of the things that we care about. And if we think that we already know what this impact is, then probably we are in huge overconfidence because this is extremely complicated. Uh, like for instance, uh, th there's this paper that shows that if you want to reduce polarization, then maybe adding diversity in the recommendation is actually a bad idea. Uh, what they, they did is that they forced uh, people to, to, to follow some, some, some Twitter accounts of the opposite side. And probably what happened is that people got es exposed to the politicians that they already hate, and this made him, them hate them even more. So, it's like apparently good ideas may actually be very bad ideas because the world is much more complex than we usually think it is. And in order to understand what is good and to do actions that are robustly good for, for the end goals we have in mind, we absolutely need to understand what are the impacts, what are the, the implications of the different things that we're doing. And this is very, very difficult and it requires a lot of exploration, which will be a, maybe a bit harmful, but we have to do our best for it not to be too harmful. And that's exactly what the, the multi-arm, the brain bait framework is, uh, is giving us. So just like to put this in context and maybe be more explicit. So using adaptative uh, clinical trials, like using multi-arm brain bait frameworks, you won't explore things that actually lead to suicide. Yeah. But you would explore very incremental, incremental things that will suggest that the mood is going bad, and yeah. then in a very slight manner, so so that you can have the insights very quickly and, and know that this is not what you should show the people. So like this is this is something safer. Yeah, and and again, it's also about like even if you have two treat, you may have different treatments that are all positive, like that help people uh, in terms of mental health. But uh, maybe there's one that's much more effective than the other, yeah. and using this framework, you can. Uh, uh, detect this much more quickly and to and be doing a lot more good uh, thereby. So yeah, I think it, it's very, very important that these, uh, all of these ideas are uh, like more, more people get very familiar with these ideas, that it becomes something that like everybody knows about. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately so far, I think we, we're still a bit far uh, from, from this being very mainstream. Yeah, the, the multi-armed bandit very rarely pops up in and discussions, discussions about, about yeah about ethics and um, ethics of, of, of decision making and the ethics of algorithmic decision making on a large scale but it pops up a lot in terms of uh, risk minimization in terms of investments and ads 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we covered, yeah, we covered that. So that there was like the first part, like we, we really wanted to insist that, uh, so given the current debates and controversies around molecules, what works for COVID, what doesn't work, and we are in the face, we are facing a sickness where the rate of spontaneous uh, healing, so the rate of people who recover without any treatment is quite high. So it's very easy to get confused uh, because it's like, like we are in the face of a sickness where let's say 90-ish percent of people would, would, would recover without any treatment. So if I take a sample of 100 people without any control group, without any proper clinical trial protocol, and I give them just water, 90 percent, 90, 90%, about 90 percent of them would, would, would heal. Should I conclude that water is a treatment? So, so we really we are, we are in a situation now where, where like this is simplified, but this is almost where we are now, and it's it's very dangerous now that many controversies are growing based on arguments uh, that, for example, deny the role of uh, mathematics in in clinical trials. Or that we don't have reliable tools to to quantify. So so no, no it is it is wrong to say that we can't quantify the ethics of clinical trials. And uh, that's maybe one of the most uh, one of the the reasons we wanted to do this topic uh, this week yeah. is that uh, the awareness should be so we should raise awareness that that, that there, there is very serious research on this and uh, people should be uh, more aware that it exists. Yeah, yeah. I guess one one of the things that we're trying to push forward. Is in this podcast but in the well in the podcast in general is the idea that mathematics is very important actually to, to right. ethical to ethics in, in general and, and, and computer science and the idea of computation is really critical uh because in, in the right. end judgments <laughs> yeah ethics is about making the right judgments and making the right judgments depend a lot on computing. understanding the the content computing, computing the outcome having the data and doing something with the data and, and this is computation and you, you need good computation to have a good ethics. Uh, now maybe the, the second aspect, so, so I, I hope it was clear from the second part of the podcast is that be, beyond the current uh, debates about uh, how to do proper clinical trials, etc., uh, there's also the, the, the part in like the AI safety discussion that, that might have overlooked a bit uh, this question on in terms of uh, how to experiment on humans on a large scale and how to how to do a better how to do uh, the ethics of social media in, in a more mathematically informed way also it's something we hope to have conveyed in the in the last part of the podcast yeah yeah because you can imagine uh, yeah, i think i've heard it in the last uh your uh, your undivided attention which is another podcast uh, mm -hmm. uh that's really about uh recommender systems uh, in particular and that shows out all the harms uh, that, that they're doing. Uh, yeah, and the, the last, uh, your invited attention, they really stress the fact that essentially what's going on right now on social medias is the biggest, largest, most important in a sense, uh, and least controlled uh, ex scientific experiment ever undergone by, by uh, by, by mankind and it's pretty scary that uh, it's, it's going on like this yeah. and people are not using arguably the right tools to do this kind of uh, of experiment. So just like if we want to come back to the example I mentioned, so there was this experiment by Facebook in 2013 on 600,000 um, Facebook users and it, it drew a lot of controversies around the paper, which is fine. But the thing is that um, since then, so Facebook stopped publishing their research, but social media are there and they are doing experiments on human on a large scale. And, uh, and I think it's high time, we believe it's high time that, uh, that uh, public health professionals and mental health professionals and social scientists um, become, uh, so get, get a word to say on these. Uh, as much as you can't, you can't run a large clinical trial on drugs without having the approval of the FDA or whatever your national institution of health. It should it should become a standard that 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 public health authorities have a word to say about the experiments that are going on on social media. Yeah, 
Yeah, and there's a potential of saving a lot of lives, uh, especially because of, uh, well, you, you talked about suicide, for instance, and uh, this is a, a huge deal. I don't remember the figures, but it's at least hundreds of thousands of people uh, per year, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, arguably, this can be, like, you can do a lot of good, arguably, by using social media to prevent uh, such tragedies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is also experiment on uh, mental health. And this is also something that is uh, often neglected and since very long time. And then there is the, 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 the infodemic, the, what people call now the infodemic, the pandemic of misinformation on which you can act. Uh, if, if, you, if you start treat, if you start looking at social networks as, as something that should be considered with the same rigor as we consider clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. It is, so for instance, uh, if we talk about this, like there's uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, well, there's a, a, an instinctive reaction to combating these uh, uh, these uh, misinformation, which is uh, debunking the debunking mm -hmm. approach, and uh, this is going to be efficient for some people, but it's not clear at all that it's going to be efficient for most people. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, well, there are different data that suggest that maybe it's not at all the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And the research on what it is effective to communicate to different people. Depending on them, also you can do a customized uh, targeting uh, of the effectiveness of like, like deconstructing misinformation is a very important uh, research area these days, and I haven't seen it uh, tackled uh, as much as I would want it to be uh, tackled. Right. Well, I think we uh, we covered all what we wanted to do for, uh, for today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about a difficult topic, uh, the, the problem of, uh, uh, of privacy and security uh, related to machine learning. And uh, I don't remember if there's going to be a connection with uh, the COVID situation, but there's... Very loosely. Not very loosely, uh, because right. yeah, there's this problem of contact tracing, which is going to be a... a, 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 a this is a big and uh, there's so much to say about this, but yeah, uh, maybe we'll wait for next week <laughs> to discuss all of this. Cool. Uh, so I hope to see you next time. Bye.